think we're just approaching 3.30. Just wait for a few more people to uh, find their seats. Okay, then well, I think we'll try and make a start. My watch says it's 3.30ish, so uh, this is uh, name and I data identifiers. So if it's name and identifiers you've come to see, then you're in the right place. Uh, I'm Richard Davis from the University of London, and I'm going to be your chair for uh, the next hour and a half. Uh, I've been asked to make a couple of prior announcements, uh, which I'll also try and remember to make again at the end. Uh, one is to confirm that drinks is at seven at the National Museum. Uh, very important one to make first. Um, and the second announcement is to make sure you all know that you're all invited to the developer show and tell session taking place in Lecture Theatre 4, which I think is the next one along. Uh, it says, come and support and encourage our entrance and grab a drink from the concourse and go straight in. And that session is five till six. So that will then give you plenty of time to get down for more drinks at the uh, museum. So it's going to be a good evening. So uh, right, the session on uh, name and data identifiers. Our first speaker is Simeon Warner, who's going to take the stage. Um, some of you may remember Simeon last year at uh, Austin, who uh, wowed us all with a presentation, a, a very, very lightning talk, called uh, Don't Bold the Field Name. Uh, something which we all empathised with. So now today Simeon is going to talk to us about uh, ORCID update and why you should use ORCIDs in your repository. Is that working? Can you hear at the back? Yes, good. OK, well, you still shouldn't bold the field name. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about that today. Uh, trying to work up to another Pecha Kucha next year is going to be something along the lines of uh, why I hate fixed width web layouts, uh, and why you should too. But today I'm talking about a much more exciting project, uh, ORCID. Um, I'm speaking with my sort of Cornell archive hat on on one side and also as a member of the ORCID board, so you'll have to forgive me for being part of the machine in a way for this. Um, so a game of two halves. The first half is uh, an update on ORCID and I'm going to sort of follow right through right from the beginning because I'm assuming there will be a number of people here who don't know a great deal about ORCID. Uh, and the second half I'll then talk more specifically about the repository case and interfacing with ORCID. So for those of you who do know about ORCID, my apologies for this first half. I hope you can catch up on your email. So we love this little joke. The scholarly record is broken. And it's broken because there's no reliable attribution of authorship associated with people's contributions, be they scholarly papers, data sets, comments on blogs, or whatever. People like Simeon Warner don't have so much of a problem, because I usually write my first name out, and my first name and second name together are pretty good at identifying me, and it shows up pretty well in the string search. But even that's kind of fuzzy. People called Wen Li or uh, X Zhang or something, even in small repositories, find that they are massively duplicated. And even if you have a unique string, that's still not particularly good, because it's just a string. You don't know it's really just an identity of an author. It could show up in many different contexts. So ORCID is all about solving this problem. And 
I think there's really a message I want to sort of repeat as many times as I can through this talk, that we want to face this challenge of applying unique IDs to identify people in all the records associated with the scholarly world. So across all organizations, all types of contribution, all types of activity associated with the contribution. So we're not limited here to just, I wrote a paper, could be edited, contributed to a data set, curated this. And throughout a large number of stakeholders. So, ORCID. ORCID is an amazing opportunity which sort of magically appeared a couple of years ago. Suddenly, the commercial publishing sector, the sort of abstracting and indexing sector, people in academic repositories such as Archive, we were all talking about the same thing. And everyone suddenly said, no one's going to do this alone and make it work. Let's all do it together. So it really is international, interdisciplinary, open. And the organization we've set up is a not-for-profit, registered in Delaware. It's existed for about a year now. And we have membership and participation from research institutions, funding organizations, publishers, and researchers. And we're trying to limit the scope of what we're doing. We're trying to create a registry of persistent, unique identifiers for researchers and scholars, which then enables linkages of research objects, things they create, what they've done. So just to repeat, contributor, not just author, and contributions, very general, not just articles. ORCID has adopted a, a set of very open principles for how it will go about, consistent with the idea that as an organization that has to be sustainable, we'll have to have some things that we give as a benefit to members. We'll create this registry, and we're going to try and encourage this adoption everywhere. It really will only work if it's used very broadly. The failure of earlier attempts to create sort of a widespread author ID system have been because they were not widespread enough. You get, you get to some point, it doesn't work. There have been successful projects which have had identifiers in you know, a smaller scoped arena. But one of the features of research is that you know, I was a physicist. I'm now sort of moved through computer science, maybe a librarian. You know, where is my field? Where does all my stuff live? If there were a, a physics ID system, that would capture a little part of me. So to create a record associated with an author ID, you need some amount of information to help you manage that. You need this to be associated with something that helps you identify the person. So there are some ideas that to create a record in the ORCID system, you have to have a name, an email, a few other bits of information. And the option for users to publicize certain other bits of information through their profile, which may be then useful in making that profile useful to them. Privacy is an issue. As soon as you start giving a name to things, associating data with it, people get concerned about this. So we have a principle that everything in ORCID is opt-in. If you're an author and you really want to hide your record, you can hide it. Of course, there may be a chain of identifiers out there, but you, know, you can't take that away. But you can control the information that's displayed about you. And we have a set of open principles about how ORCID will interact with other organizations, how we will allow people to build services on top of ORCID and use the infrastructure. So the key benefit, disambiguation of researchers and the tracking of activity of researchers. Additional information in the profile might help automate, help automate various tasks like deposition of repositories. As soon as we start linking things together, 
There's less of going through all these records, doing searches, collating your output and feeding it in some form. Hopefully, we can build systems which leverage the ID to support that. There are more than 300 organizations so far that have signed up as ORCID participants, and 50 of those have provided funded, funding which has helped ORCID get going. Uh, we also have a significant amount of loan funding from organizations to help ORCID sort of get started, put in place a business model, and uh, become sustainable. Membership from all over the world. Now, I'll just try and go through a sort of few workflows of how, how an ORCID might be used in, for different stakeholders, different contexts. So for a search organization, it's a goal to create a sort of record of ha everything that happens to the researchers in that organization. Of course, you don't want to assign a whole slew of staff to doing this. Perhaps you want to integrate with your institutional repository. So if we go through the set of arrows on the on the right here, this is sort of in the context of the APIs or ORCID is creating. The organization, as a member, would register with ORCID and there'd be a sort of authenticated transaction between the two systems. At some stage, ORCID might search for the record of a particular person or matching person, and the organization might be then leverage whatever local data it has to try and resolve duplicates, create an initial set of data that's useful pull out a set of data that's relevant to them. And in the case that the organization is trying to seed a set of identifiers for its members, once it's done whatever searches based on data it already holds to try and avoid creating additional duplicates, identifiers can be created, profiles can be created for researchers ready for them to claim, but nothing is made public until they're claimed by a researcher. So there would perhaps be an email sent to researchers saying, you know, the University of Cornell has created a record for you, Simeon. Please go and do this. The idea being that my university has then helped me do it by seeding it with information it already knows, knows, therefore saving me effort. And if I then go and claim that record, I've very easily created identity for myself, a way that the institute, the organization can help the researcher. So. Granting bodies. Uh, I don't know if it's quite the same in uh, the UK, but in the US certainly there's always a sort of complaint and therefore a, a worry on the granting bodies about the burden that the reporting they demand puts on their researchers. So what if we tied this up to an ORCID identity? Once again, the funding body system might uh, coordinate with, with ORCID and do its authentication. It might track the ORCIDs of researchers through the grant application process. It would then be helped in the process of associating the publications resulting from this, this work, again reducing the burden on the researcher. Similar sort of idea with the publisher. You submit your manuscript, you submit your manuscript with your ORCID, goes through the publication process. If you have granted the publisher the ability, you can allow it to add the final information about your publication back into the ORCID registry, and that DOI association with your name is then recorded for you. Again, saving you effort and creating a more accurate record. So a whole set of workflows like this gives us a sort of vision of unique identifiers for authors traveling around as early as possible in the creation of each artifact and following, following people around, and then allowing the set of articles in Elsevier's database to play nicely with the set of articles in the archive database at Cornell and the uh, institutional repository at Hull, where my collaborator works, for example. Uh, none of this relying on my name being Simeon Warner, but on a unique identity for me. So ORCID spent a lot of time sort of creating itself, and 
we are working toward what we call the phase one system, which will have notions of research yourself claim. I can go to the website, I can create an ID, and I can use that. If someone asks me for it, I can, I can enter it. It'll have the notion of delegated management. I can say that because my wonderful local library is happy to manage my profile and add the things I then put into the repository for me, I can perhaps delegate the management if I want. A system where an institution can seed records for authors but relies on them then claiming, claiming them. And a system for interaction with authorized trusted parties, such as when I go through this manuscript submission system, I say, yes, I allow this journal to ask for an update on my profile or to have perhaps put a record back because I trust them. So right now, we have API specifications, a development sandbox, code to download and run your local system. We are in the process of working out a set of launch partners and early test. And actually, I'll skip to the timeline, which is better. Uh, we are, that line's maybe a smidge further. Throughout the rest of this year, I think the big box is here, Q4, launch V1.1. That's where ORCID really goes live. Individuals can create an identity that will persist and be useful. Um, expected November of this year. We have a number of publishers actively working to integrate this interaction workflow in their publishing systems. And some more that aren't listed there or not quite willing to be public are also working on it. Um, a number of research organizations, including my own, trying to work out how, how that part of it will work in detail. Uh, and we've had a number of conversations with research funders both in the US and the UK and elsewhere. So I will talk about the APIs more in just a second. Right now, the structure of an ORCID will be that, a meaningless number following an HTTP prefix. So it will be a resolvable thing. You know, you'll be able to link to that, go there, and you'll get something about the profile. You can content negotiate on it to get some data out of it. As I said, code APIs available. And now, why should you use ORCID in your repository? I'll spend a few minutes talking about value propositions for a few of the stakeholders in this place, and then I'll just go through the interactions from a repository point of view enabled with both the tier one and tier two APIs. So one can pull out a number of different stakeholders in the institutional and disciplinary repository space. I'm going to sort of talk about three here, which I think are pretty easy to see. There's the author, the creator. There's the research community, which is really a set of readers. And then there's the research institutions themselves. So institutional authors, sorry, individual authors want credit for their work. And they usually want it to be found and used. And we can all quote exceptions, perhaps. ORCID should, will help increase the likelihood of them getting credit for it. I think that's a key motivation. Um, this will be particularly useful for people with common names, although my colleague Michael Nelson says he sometimes likes to be conflated with another Michael Nelson who has a good publication record. <laughs> um, I think it also opens the door to linking in the same way artifacts that currently wouldn't be linked in in analyses of uh, citation and things like that, because it'll be done in the same way. It opens the door to more nuanced notions of attribution, and it offers a way to save effort by reusing the data in your profile in lots of systems that ask you to type in the same information in their silly form. So for readers, it offers the possibility of better discovery and analysis tools. Um, it seems odd in a way that I'm speaking at the same time that I believe Alex Wade is speaking in the next room, 
uh, about Microsoft Academic Search, which would benefit greatly from having ORCIDs widely used. Better ways to locate collaborators, understand fields, and to understand and measure contributions. Universities and research institutions obviously have a, an angle in this for reporting and tracking. Uh, in discussion with local folks, I was amused by this little four libraries bullet. I, I said in a library, we believe that if we had these tools, we could better understand how to do our job as a library to serve our authors. Now, with my archive hat on, you know, why, do, why am I in this game? The history of my involvement in this game is that Archive and CERN, Inspire, and ADS have been talking for a few years about how we could create an author ID system that spanned our three repositories. So the opportunity to say, hey, why roll our own? Let's use something that could work across the world was a, a big draw. Archive has you know, a small collection of research compared with the world output. It has a near perfect collection for the past 15 years in a few disciplines. And still, it is essential that we interoperate with other repositories that are important in our field, NASA ADS and Inspire. There are things we just can't do at the moment because we don't have a sensible link between the authorship in these fields. Uh, I'm standing here in the UK. There's a GISC report that's linked here, which recommends ORCID as the solution for IDs in the UK and is currently engaged in the process of validating the recommendations of this report. I hope they'll move forward with that. As a sort of, I like repositories and I think they should be an important part of the research landscape argument, I think a reason for repositories being early adopters of ORCID is that it helps make repositories count in a field in parallel with conventional journal publications and everything else. You know, if we want our repositories to be important, we have to, to play in that game. So, you want to integrate with ORCID. Good, I'm glad you did. Uh, there are two tiers to the API at the moment. Tier 1 and Tier 2, and I'll discuss each in turn. Uh, just, I'm going to get slightly technical in a few of these slides, and I apologize to anyone who's not interested in that. And, uh, all the APIs do content negotiation and return XML or, or JSON data, you know, easy integration in web interfaces, things like that. The Tier 1 API is available to everyone, no charge, no access controls. What does this facilitate? So if you're running a repository, you can ask an author for their ORCID. That, of course, puts the burden on them getting it, knowing it, maybe they shouldn't have to know it. But if you get it for some reason, however, you can go to the ORCID website, you can check that it exists, and find out any information the author has chosen to make public. You might also provide within your repository submission process some sort of pop-up, which allows them to do a search for their ORCID. Um, public API for providing a, a search over the metadata that authors have allowed to be public. Again, you know, there's always a competition between functionality and privacy, and we've opted for the privacy option uh, because we think that widespread acceptance is critical. There's also an annual dump of all public claimed author data from ORCID. So if you want to ingest that for whatever purpose, some sort of matching, searching, that's possible too and openly available. ORCID members will have access to an authenticated SLA-backed API which provides access both to the public data and if users grant it to what we're calling protected data about them. Data they are saying they don't want to release on the public web, but they want to allow trusted parties to access. So for example, if you run an institutional repository, I think it's reasonable to say that a great many of your researchers would grant you access to their protected data. And the workflow provides both a validation of the ORCID identity as being owned by that researcher because they go through a login process and allows you know, this trust mechanism whereby the author says, okay, I'm trusting you as a repository to do certain things. So there are really three steps to this process, which I'll 
just go through quickly. Any member organization running a service would get a sort of API key in the first stage of the OAuth process so that you know, your repository, ORCID, they have a trusted relationship. Secondly, say we've got a user coming into the system, and I'm sorry you can't read this, it's <laughs> on the website, but I didn't want to try and break it up into 15 slides. The repository, say, redirects the user to the ORCID website to either log in or perhaps create a profile. The user logs into ORCID, therefore validating that they own that ID. They're not just claiming it, they're saying, you know, I've actually got authority to access this record. And they then say, I want to grant your repository access to this, this part of data. I want to allow you to update it with my information later or something, or not. But either way, the workflow allows the user to be directed back to your repository with information saying, yes, this person really is the one who owns that ORCID and possibly token granting additional rights to the repository. So then in the case that uh, some additional access has been granted, the repository can then use that key for an amount of time until it's revoked by the user or you know, ORCID sysadmins revoke it for some, some reason, uh, allowing them access to the protected data and potentially with this idea of a workflow where you know, something happens out of band and maybe a, an article is published and new information is known about that, for the repository to push data back into ORCID on behalf of the user, again, saving them time. All of this can be played with. Um, the key URL is that one up on the top, dev.orchid.org. This has API specs, has some example code to access them in Ruby and Java, schemas for response documents, things like that. Uh, whoops, wrong button. Sorry. So that's the end. If you need more information, a lot of URLs there. These slides will be up on the conference website. And I'll put them up on SlideShare as well. ORCID is uh, now with uh, both an executive director, Laurie Hack, and we have a technical director started recently. We have two full-time staff people. Um, you're also welcome to come and talk to me in the remainder of the day or the remainder of the conference. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Simeon. And I think that's, uh, if I bring it in so, so well under time, we've definitely got time for a question or two. So uh, is there anything in anybody's uh, mind, any burning questions? Brian, would you like You mentioned that ORCID will be sending information to Crossref. So the obvious question is, what about data site? Um, I don't think I said ORCID will be sending information to Crossref. You said ORCID ID and DOI pairings? Right, so we already have built-in facilities for import of data from Crossref. Um, we currently don't have an envisaged workflow of going the other way. Now, if actually, to be honest, I don't know whether Crossref has the ability for someone creating a DOI to include ORCIDs in the metadata that goes to Crossref. If it doesn't already, I'm guessing at some stage it will in the future. But I think that would be controlled by the authority that creates the DOI and not by ORCID. Because DOIs are really owned by someone. One of the interesting things in this world is if you, you know, oh, so ORCID's just a DOI for people, right? Well, who owns people? You know, DOIs are easy in the sense that Someone has the right for that publication. They are they created the DOI, so they own it. They know what to do. In in, in the people case, you know, a person <laughs> owns it, which is why there are so many subtleties around creating things for people. Is that all right? So definitely, I encourage you to talk with DataSite and and make sure that when someone files, you know information with ORCID that that information propagates and it's available through the data site system as well. Right. Well, certainly if it's public on ORCID, then anyone can harvest it back. Certainly ORCID has the ability to take a data site DOI as, just as well as it does any other sort of DOI. Um, and yes, I, I think 
clearly. If there's the metadata containing authorship information, it should include the ORCID. So yes. Thanks, Ryan. Um, maybe just time for one more. Anyone else? Anyone else? Uh, can I ask here? Is this closer? <laughs> Sorry, Nicola. <laughs> Hi, it's Natasha from Griffith University. Um, you said that an organisation is prompted to resolve duplicates. Um, is that done by a person or is that um, through the API or how is that envisaged? We are working on that. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're not ready to roll out bulk creation of identifiers for third parties at the moment. So the initial workflows that we anticipate are really author self-creation or <coughs> self-creation as part of a publication process. And the sort of early adopter collaborations with research institutions are precisely to work out exactly the mechanics of that. Um, because really the, the goal is to save effort for everyone, especially the researcher, because both ORCID and research institutions will annoy researchers if we go and create dupes for them. They then have to call up someone or send an email or something. That's bad. Um, yeah. Right, I think that's probably all we've got time for. We better let Amanda uh, get on and get ready for her talk. Um, so thank you, Simeon. Maybe a quick clap for Simeon again. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And now, next up, we have Amanda Hill from University of